So I will um, unfortunately keep it a bit more technical. Um, I will talk about how to set up your data foundations um, and ideally make them ready for like future, future success. All right, so who am I? Um, I studied, I have a mixed background. I worked in, oh, I studied business in the Netherlands. I worked in uh, Berlin for a couple of startups, dipped my toes into um, business intelligence, and then decided to do a master's degree in business analytics, uh, technical program, learned Python, SQL, R, statistical methods, and then um, got to join the micromobility wave through Julian over here um, at Coop which was one of the first, um, yeah, bigger, the, the more, the electric scooters, essentially, that you see here still on the street. Um, as a first data hire, I was tasked to build out the data infrastructure there. Um, and after two and a half years, I left for a new challenge, again with Julian, to Tier, um, where I got the chance to build the data team from zero. Um, first as a head of BI, um, and then over the three years that I was there into a full-fledged data function covering data engineering, data analytics, business intelligence, um, where I managed five teams um, across, yeah, with around 50 people. And yeah, then decided um, I had enough of that, um, wanted to get back to building, and I joined Firebolt, which was a is a data warehousing company based out of Israel. They want to build something similar to Snowflake, less pricey, faster, um, but that was fully remote and I decided I wanted to start building a team again, own a bit the infrastructure that we're building and uh, got the chance to join Gigs. So as was announced, we're trying to build a sort of an API layer on top of um, the global telcos. So as a developer, you can make one API call and create a phone subscription with Telefonica, with AT&T, with Telecom, without knowing anything about telcos. That's the ambition. And as head of, head of data there, um, we basically want to provide visibility to the business, like where we're going, what we're doing, provide product analytics, but we also want to embed data into our product so that our customers can actually see what's happening, how many subscriptions they're creating, what uh, their cohorts are look, uh, looking like, what the MRR is looking like for them. So it's two components, one internal and one uh, external facing. Fun fact, I don't know how to whistle. Um, so my learnings are mostly from heavily operational businesses. They had a, an app component, so there's product analytics involved, but also uh, large operational teams that we supported with data. We help them understand their processes. Might be a bit different from more traditional, like pure software companies, um, but I'm making that learning right now at Gigs. So keep, in, keep that in mind. Might not apply to everything. Um, my goal today, and I don't really know the audience, but I want to provide a better understanding of how data teams are set up, um, what roles exist in a data team, and sort of what, what you're getting yourself into when you start actually building that sort of um, infrastructure around uh, collecting data, processing data, and then making that available to the business. Second goal would be to kind of make you aware of um, yeah, the investment. When, do you, when should you start investing? Um, what to hire first? Where to start? And uh, what the sort of tooling and costs are um, that you could be facing. And then more around the environment, how data teams would or can operate uh, effectively, and that's then around centralized teams versus embedding. Miriam talked about this before. Um, we want to talk about budgeting and sort of overall success factors. So first of all, what's uh, in data? Um, you talk about data analytics, data science, data engineering, BI. So. There are sort of four components um, around data. First is the data engineering side, where you take data out of source systems, um, out of your internal backend, maybe your product production applications and external sources, and you pipe that into a storage layer. Then you have a function called analytics engineering. They take basically this raw data that is now made accessible and transform that into something meaningful. They apply common naming conventions to fields. Um, they bring 
des separate data sources together, so they make them useful for then the next team, which is the BI and the analytics function, which then build dashboards, define metrics, run analyses for the, for the business teams. And then data science sort of comes, comes at the end. They try to de derive advanced insights, predict things, predict the future, based on the data that's made available. And there's overlap between these roles. Everybody can do parts of it, um, parts of the, the other roles. But data engineering is probably the most um, close to like software engineering, and then kind of goes more into the business side. And then data science, again, is more, it's much more technical than the other two. So. Um, at a high level, um, what do we want to build, and what are, what are we building when we say we're building da a data stack? So you see here three different colors. They indicate sort of maturity. Um, the blue ones, the blue cars are actually the foundations, then followed up with stability, the top, top layer, and then uh, in purple, sort of the more advanced stuff. Um, let me walk you through really quick, quickly what we have. So we have on the left side, sort of in, like data sources. You have internal data sources, as I mentioned, production databases, um, files flying around. Then you have SaaS tools, your Stripe, HubSpot, Google Sheets that everybody uses. You have um, event capture in terms of product analytics tools. And this data has to get into a data warehouse. So yeah, there's basically the data integration component. You, use, you can use tools, but you can also build your own pipelines. Um, that all depends on sort of your capabilities in your team. Then there's a storage layer, basically your data warehouse, where all the raw data ends up. And a small but very important part is the transformation and orchestration layer, where you're basically, this analytics engineering team is taking the raw data and providing meaning around it. And then the BI tool, and it's very small, sorry for that, uh, the BI tool basically sits on top of that model data, and the product analytics solution basically consumes data directly from from the event tracking that's placed in your, in your applications. Then once you hit maturity, and basically this is what you kind of have to have as a foundation, otherwise you can't, be able, you can't even do uh, the more advanced um, stuff. Um, once you move to maturity, you want to actually monitor this, right? If you have a complex system like this, you want to know whether stuff breaks, you want to test the data that's coming in, um, and you want to kind of have better ability to schedule certain workloads across the whole, the whole system. And once that's done, then you can start thinking about what you actually want to do with it, uh, with that data, besides providing kind of guidance and uh, visibility into the business. And then you can start thinking about implementing sort of data science and machine learning applications on top of that. Um, and a new sort of bucket that's emerging is called data activation. So taking, taking the data that you've now created, say, say the, you've clustered or segmented your users into different groups, and you want to then pipe that data into your CRM system to be able to better target them. So then moving that data again into your systems, sort of full circle, is also a bit more advanced work that uh, requires basically a solid foundation in the beginning. So this is a chart from FirstMark. It's called the MAD landscape, machine learning, AI, and data science. It's a complete mess. Um, but as you can see, there are two messages to it. You can find pretty much a tool for everything, every single use case that you have in that data stack that I just showed. Um, but you also need people that kind of know where to look, what to, what to buy. Um, but again, it's, it's a very complex world and uh, calling for consolidation for sure. That's not working. No. So what are the messages here? Um, first, focus on foundations. Um, build, build something that we can build on top of, and then iteratively basically continue to build out your, your, your data stack um, accordingly. And grow your team along these dimensions as well. You don't need data scientists in the beginning. You should focus on that once you have sort of your foundation built out. Then. Uh, you, as somebody who would be maybe investing in a data team, understand the complexity, right? Um, it's not about just taking a, da a data sh or Excel sheet and applying some transformation to it. If you want to have consistently fresh data, you need to basically have this sort of setup. And this also comes then with um, the burden that your data team has to understand both the complexity of the infrastructure, but also the complexity of your business and understanding how they can actually define KPIs and build KPIs on top of that. 
So even small things can take a long time, and tech debt is, a, is a, unfortunately a thing. Um, if, the, if the data engineering team, uh, sorry, if the software engineering team changes something in the product, the data might change. That might have downstream impact on what the data analyst is basically providing. Dashboards will break. It's never a small fix. It's something you really have to understand and deep dive into, and this can really take a while to, to, to do. So one more learning is to invest in tooling. Um, the, the main benefit of basically doing this was at Tier we were able to build a 10-people BI team with only a single data engineer in there. And that was only possible because we invested into very strong tooling, um, first on the data ingestion side, on the data modeling side, but also on the BI side. So when should you actually start investing in, <coughs> in data? And Mariam talked about it as, as well, um, sort of that um, gap when you're transitioning from basically find, figuring out if you have product market fit to kind of transitioning into it. Um, you have sort of the feeling that you're not clear anymore um, what's going on, how many subscriptions maybe you have. Um, that's sort of when you're feeling you're flying sort of blindly and then uh, an investment is um, becoming more and more clear in this. Um, yeah, you are hiring people across um, other functions, sales. Might, maybe you already have sales in place, but if you hire finance, if you hire operations, these people will need um, access to data. And that's also the kind of a tipping point where you should then consider actually starting your, your search for your first data hire. If you already have somebody in your organization, probably somebody in finance or maybe in the biz dev team that's actively or mo spending most of their time building content in Excel um, and building reporting that the company is relying on, um, that is not going to scale well and will break down the line. So these are, these are the things to, wa to watch out for. And then especially in Germany, uh, hiring takes a long time. Especially these people are very hard to find. And it will also take time to build all that. So you kind of have to anticipate that you are going to wait six to, I don't know, maybe nine months that you get actually something rolling. Um, so hit the right time when you're actually starting to hire for this position. So who do we want to hire first when we start getting started? Um, there's sort of three profiles that are um, essential. One is um, sort of a senior data hire on the left that is going to build a team. They're going to build an architect system that um, will fit your business. They will interview stakeholders. They will talk with tooling providers. And they um, ideally have done this before um, to basically just know where they have to go. Solid business understanding, communication skills, and technical understanding are important. Um, and they will need to do data engineering, analytical work, data modeling, insight generation. So a very hard profile to find, <laughs> but they do exist. Um, people will, uh, will love to basically do this. Setting up a data stack is a challenge that a lot of like, analytics professionals want to do. Um, so you have that as an argument to basically pull people into, um, into this uh, sort of uh, work environment. The second person, and again, this depends a bit on, on the type of company that you are. Um, if the insights are sort of um, yeah, more readily available and uh, getting the data out of your source systems is relatively complex and you might have uptime guarantees, for example, in our case, that we need to embed data into a product, then a data engineer should be the second investment. Again, here, um, two to three years should be plenty, plenty experience if they have already worked in uh, sort of BI teams um, before. Um, and then the third, third hire can be a senior or a, just a data analyst that can then take a lot of work of the um, first hire's um, workload. And uh, again, ideally here, they have experience with um, working in like smaller teams. There is a problem with analysts coming from larger organizations in that they um, are very focused on like small parts of the machine. They might know how one data set looks like and how they have optimized the hell out of it. But um, they're lacking a bit more the overall understanding, like where is the data coming from? It involves talking to engineering 
to involves talking to your stakeholders to basically define metrics. So again, this experience in early stage companies is a, um, a huge bonus. Um, so look out for that if you can. Um, just an overview of the different roles, and uh, there's no content in this table, but just an overview. The data engineer gets the data into the data warehouse. The analytics engineer and the data analyst can transform the data, and with SQL, the data analyst and the data scientist can derive insights from the data, and then the data scientist and the machine learning engineer, again, more advanced roles, not really relevant for more early stage companies, make predictions based on the data and deploy machine learning models. Um, if your company is doing something in AI, you would have this part of your core software engineering team, then they wouldn't be part of a separate data team. So how do we uh, hire these people? Let me drink something. You really have to sell the role. Um, as I said, offering them the challenge of building something from scratch is uh, a huge bonus. Um, provide them with examples of the data that you would be looking at. Um, if you are looking for somebody, you already have some exports available, and uh, hook them on modern modern data tooling. Um, yeah, budgets obviously um, make sure, especially for that first hire, make sure that uh, you promise them or you you give them the budget to basically fulfill their role. Um, one thing I've observed in um, especially, and this more applies now to to my experience at Tier, when the overall organization grows like crazy, um, and a data team is very dependent on the overall growth of the organization, um, you need to have close alignment basically with your stakeholders that are reliant on your basically insights. So the best way I found to do this was to talk to, talk to stakeholders and get them to basically off offer up headcount for an analyst. So they, they actually make the, the investment um, together with you, and you would be basically managing that res resource for them. And um, paying data hires, especially data engineers and analytics engineers, close to sort of the close to or in the same bracket as software engineering, um, is very important to retain them. The skill set is hard to come by, and um, they, you will want to retain them because uh, knowing the and understanding the core data and how the systems work is very important, um, especially in the world of data where. Uh, stuff changes all the time, and you need to have a lot of historical knowledge that cannot always be documented. And then one thing I um, learned works quite well in assessing good quality candidates, but also selling them the role, is using technical cases during the interview process. Um, you might not immediately see from a CV whether somebody is a good fit for your role. Um, analysts and data scientists can, can come from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, but using a short take-home case with obfuscated data it doesn't have to be something that it shouldn't be something that you're constantly working on, but something that you just have as a CSV file lying around, and you send that with some questions to to these analysts is a very good uh, tool to see how they're doing in terms of communication, in terms of technical skills, and even if you can't read code, you can look at code and see whether it's well documented. It's uh, well structured, and they can talk about it. Um, so this also, again, shows them if, you, if, they, if they can work with real data that it's in, an interesting company to work for. So you can get, um, have that going for you. Another rule of thumb, um, I don't have a source, unfortunately, but 5 to 10% of your company, it, again, depends on the industry, um, but in software companies in general, 5 to 10% should be around on, uh, in, in the data team. Um, so just keeping it around that ratio is um, going to make sure that you are not uh, falling behind or the data team is not falling behind and becoming a huge bottleneck. There will always be a bottleneck, but not uh, that big of a bottleneck anymore. So how should we set up um, our team? There are two ways, uh, actually there are three ways. There's the um, centralized approach, there's the embedding approach, and then the decentralized approach. I'm just going to talk about centralized and embedding. Um, especially in the early days where budget is tight and your team size is super small, um, you will need to have, you need to build a centralized data team, BI team. Um, you will get inbound requests from finance, sales, marketing, product, ops, 
everybody will want data and you will need to prioritize and it's going to be very difficult to um, shift analysts from um, basically um, topic to topic. An analyst needs to be able to kind of focus and deep dive on their data sets to do great work and partner basically with the different functions, but that's not going to be re realistic in the early days where you just have a small team. But what we saw work quite well um, at, at TIA was to basically move to this more hybrid approach where you build foundational work in a central data team and you embed these analysts into the different groups. So, for example, in pr product, every product team would have a dedicated product analyst that then would report back into the, have a dotted line reporting into, uh, into the central data team. Uh, and the same went basically for all, all sorts of um, business units that then had somebody that was part of their rituals, they were felt part of the team, um, they attended their stand-ups and attended um, all sorts of decision-making meetings and were able to raise voice uh, whenever there was some data question that they could answer, um, come up with input, and especially true on the product side and operation side, that was uh, a model that worked quite well. Um, the decentralized model is where you would have basically data people sitting in each team and reporting directly into the manager of the respective function. Um, I've, we've tried this out in, in finance, for example, and it's just doesn't work. These people are very technical. They want to belong basically to a group of people that have a shared sort of understanding of the world. And in this case, it's of data. Um, and a, a finance manager cannot un understand the technical limitations of the work that goes into data. Um, so in this case, there's a lot more, a bit more overhead between the head of data and the sort of head of finance in this case that they have to discuss um, priorities and timelines but it's worth retaining and basically gaining good quality analysts. Uh, no strong analyst in my experience would actually join a team where they would have to report into one of these functions directly. So the core benefit of actually building the centralized team is a shared culture and um, it's basically, yeah, values that we share around data testing, quality, control, um, and access about, around data. We have yeah, shared language around how we describe the business. There's no discrepancies in measuring how revenue is kind of computed. Um, that's basically all set in the central team. Um, values like accuracy, timely, timeliness, and reproducibility of data are important and can be kind of honed as, um, basically as part of onboarding, as part of working together with other analysts. And then kind of uh, jokes, memes, rituals um, are all things that we can basically then engage in together with, uh, as a data group. So let's get a bit more concrete. Uh, what does this cost? Um, so just to get started, and again, the big uh, cost driver is sort of headcount. This can also be done with one person. Um, but if we just look at tooling at the, uh, in the beginning, um, just getting data out of systems, um, the data warehouse itself, data transformations, and a BI tool, you will be able to get something up and running for around like 20K. Um, and this all depends on um, the amount of data and the, um, the size of your company. Um, and how that's going to grow. A lot of these tools, they price basically on data volume, data sources you connect to, and um, seats that you basically offer up um, to, your, to your users. Um, and this goes especially so for the BI tools, they would be uh, charging for your users. The ingestion tools would be about the sources and the volume of data. Um, yeah, some tools that I would recommend to use, um, five trend for data ingestion, BigQuery if you're already on GCP, Snowflake if on AWS, don't use Redshift, um, DBT for the transformation layer, and then there are Google Data Studio is free, and Metabase is sort of also comparably cheap. So we would be looking at over, it's not a cost you would incur immediately, but it's like monthly cost, and it's going to grow over time, but you're looking at like a yearly cost around 200K. Um, for a very advanced data setup that's going to get you ready for that next sort of phase of growth. Um, and then how is that going to develop um, over time? When you move towards maturity, you will grow your team 
obviously that will come with uh, additional costs. Um, all these tools will start to incur or will become more expensive over time, uh, especially on the data ingestion side and the data warehouse side. Um, it really depends on how heavy, heavily you are invested in data and how heavily you use it. Um, and then the BI tools will become more expensive again because it's so, so related to the number of users. And then uh, there's another bracket for additional tooling. Could be product analytics if you're heavily investing into that or into monitoring. Um, but again, 400 to 600K probably in the second year or third year of operating a, a data team, again, with around 80 people maybe working with data. Not a company size of 80, but 80 people working on data. So to wrap things up, um, four things that I uh, just want to give, uh, give you uh, along the way. So if you invest in your data team, really involve them. Um, there's no point in having it without um, making them part of core decision-making meetings. Um, you, would, you underestimate always how much these people kind of know about the data that's describing your business, and they can basically speak up and pull something together in a very short time. Um, so try just adding these, these analysts to your meetings, or your head of data into your management meeting, and um, see where that, where that takes you, and encourage them to speak up, right? And that's also important. Um, then also very important, because we saw it uh, again and again, it's, this is very um, engineering heavy, it's very technical. You need engineering buy-in uh, every once in a while. You need to get engineering investment uh, in terms of engineering support to get some sort of data into a shape and form that is useful. Um, invest maybe in event tracking on the, on the back-end side, um, extract data from different sources that might be out of scope for the, for the, for the data engineer and that engineering is not treating data as some sort of um, exhaust, but this is actually part of the delivered product or the delivered feature. Um, in the future, you can talk, think about stuff like data contracts, but this these is more um, yeah, once, once you transition through the, the maturity phases. Um, and then again, the data discipline itself is moving very much to like software engineering practices. We're using version control, we're testing our setups, we're using monitoring and logging. Um, this is very much a change to how, how data used to be, a very fragmented and like pieced together um, setups. Um, so for example, at TI I reported into the CTO, um, first into product, then into finance, and in the end, when the challenges became much more engineering challenges, I reported into the CTO. Educating your users uh, around um, how to use the data. So especially when you have that small team, you have a lot of people asking questions. You really want to basically educate them in how to use that sort of self-service setup. Um, people close to the business are much more capable of answering questions than any analyst could that's not embedded. Um, you know the fields much better. Like more concretely, you know um, your customers. You, you can easily spot issues in the data if you're like dealing with the processes day to day. An analyst might not be able to do that. So running education sessions, trainings, and identifying sort of your data champions in the company that then the data team can embrace and use and leverage across the organization to kind of um, praise the BI or data gospel. And then one last thing, and we've done this at tier until it's still being done today, just be very transparent with your data. Um, we shared out basically everything that we had. We're not sharing like investor stuff material, but revenue data, for example, was wide open for everybody to see. Um, so this is really just giving the organization trust in using data and kind of asking questions um, on stuff that is um, yeah, might not be so so straightforward in other organizations. And then constantly share like your main metrics on something like Slack or on email. Uh, just send your PDF reports around every week or so. But if you have Slack, you can even do it on a daily basis. Like pick one or two metrics um, for your teams and then just share that out and, prov and create the sort of awareness around metrics and how they're trending over time. That's uh, super important to get buy-in and, and uh, interest. You will not find basically everybody to be super interested in, in utilizing data, but with this approach, by pushing this out into basically the tools that people spend their time in, you will be able to kind of get those that are actually interested in data to engage with it rather than trying to pull them into your tools um, on a daily basis, which is going to be hard. 
And with that, thank you. <laughs> Open for questions. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question regarding the, the test you were talking uh, during the hiring phase of a profile. I think there is like an assumption of the fact that the person doing the hiring knows how to make the questions regarding the data. Um, what if you don't have anybody in the team that knows data well enough to hire a senior data something? Um, how can you make a proper test that it's not you know too simple and shallow, but at the same time that makes sense and it's understandable to you? So uh, what we did, uh, I was a bit more technical, but still I would say I wouldn't be able to judge a data engineering back, data engineer back then. But taking questions that you have as a, as a business, you, you might not know something, right? Like you, ha you have, um, I don't know, some export from your, from your database um, that you can easily get from your engineering team and somebody might be building reports on this already. And then defining Either you, s you define questions yourself, or you say, hey, do something, right? Like, we don't know stuff about retention, we don't know anything about acquisition, and then just let them decide, also in their own time, and that's why the time boxing is so important, like where are they going to spend their time? And then the end result matters um, for you if you're not technical, I mean, you, then that's what I mentioned. You can look at code, um, or you can ask also somebody else to look at code and kind of judge whether, you can't say whether it's good, right? But you can at least say it's sort of cleanly written and there's, there's comments and there's documentation. And you can ask that person in that session to explain their thinking behind certain things. Um, it's going to be harder if you're not technical, but it, I would say it's still possible, and then you can just evaluate different types of criteria um, along, the, along the way. Some candidates will also invest like 10 hours, 15 hours. I mean, then you already know you found like a, it will show, right? Like you will find very ambitious candidates and it will show that they invest a lot of time. Thank you very much. I think uh, this was a great presentation, especially for early stage companies that we don't really pay that much attention. One of the key challenges that we were facing at Uber before uh, uh, my actual job here was like, uh, okay, in terms of data infrastructure, it was a much more clear view. But in terms of data analytics, you had like a lot of good teams and operational teams that were, were able to handle data. So we are ending up in the operations team having a lot of data analysts inside the teams. And then you had also the centralized data, sci data analytics team. And then you had data scientist team. So it was, you know, at the end of the day, it was like several back and forth and double work. Uh, how, 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 do you, how do you solve this problem at tier now that has like... I, d I wouldn't yeah. say we solved it. So, um, so Uber was, I think, I mean, we looked at that as well, right? As, in, as inspiration, like Uber was super decentralized in general, right? So the cities were very enabled, whereas at tier, the cities were a bit more there was a city manager and they had maybe two ops managers and everything was kind of run centrally. Um, we tried to also run data more centrally, but at some point also there was a data team that emerged in the ops organization. And like there's a trade-off between making sure that stuff is like clean and everything is, everybody's looking at the same stuff and I think as I said, there's so much value in giving data to people that know what's going on in the city um, that the, like now if I would do, were to do it again I would go for more the Uber model taking into like accepting the fact that there will be a lot of back and forth and discussion um, between these teams but again I don't have a clear answer. <laughs> Yeah, so like data science and like the super advanced stuff, maybe, I don't know, centralize it, decentralize it, I don't really have an answer. It's just, these are, yeah, Uber is even at a more different stage than, than Tier is. Um, but it's a very interesting discussion. But again, this is going to last until you're a thousand people, and then, then you can deal with this sort of challenge then. Hi. 
Um, thanks for sharing all your insights. Super, super, super um, interesting to see. Um, question from my end. Let's assume you arrive at that stage where you have laid the infrastructure for your data foundation, right? And you're now probably in parallel already thinking about the data modeling and what data you actually need to track and what KPIs you need to look at. Um, what's your best practice for um, getting that first data model approach right and then also iterating on it to feedback from the ops teams into the data team to make sure that ideally you're becoming proactive in tracking the right things and having the data available, having the right definitions of certain KPIs to enable these teams and not run behind them all the time to um, identify the right things that they need to generate insights from the data. So to summarize, just how, how to get started with the foundation, like data model foundation, and then... How would you, like, what would you be your ideal process mm -hmm. for defining the data model for the first time? And what rituals would you run in the team to iterate on them um, to yeah. be proactive? So uh, it depends a bit on the time you have. So at TIO, we didn't really have time. It was just ship metrics from day one. And the benefit I had there, I worked at Coop, so we had basically applied the same metrics that we had there. We applied them there. Uh, at Gigs, we I now have a bit more time, and uh, we have the, the luxury of basically taking, and with the approach we take, is so basically focus on a core set of data. Um, and that could be maybe your payment data or your s uh, subscription data. and understand pulling that into your system and also just keeping it at that, right? Don't say, hey, because now I can have Fivetran and I can ingest Stripe data and HubSpot data. Just keep it to like a couple of tables and then talk to, first of all, get a good understanding by talking to engineering um, because it's mostly about providing the visibility what's actually going on in our business, talking to engineering what's actually going on with that data, and then talking to possibly finance, if it's about revenue, possibly um, product or the, the, the management around what metrics do we really want to kind of uh, look at at the moment. Um, for us, it was subscriptions and MRR. Um, so these were basically the two things that we shipped first. And uh, it's an iterative process, right? Like you build something, you look at it, you need, ideally you have something to compare your data to because there will be discrepancies um, from what's in the system to what's actually ending up in uh, in the data warehouse. So with subscriptions, we compare data then to the production databases. With MRR, we look at Stripe and what they report, and then we kind of hope or approach basically some level that we feel acceptable. With production data, you would say it's, it needs to be 100% correct. With some MRR calculation that you, it's out of your control, you just can approach it at some to a certain extent, and then just iterate over over that. But focus on just a few models. Cool.